Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church. My name is Mark Wurzel. I'm an elder here, and I am glad you're joining us for this music-filled Sunday. Um, we will be starting off with I Love to Tell the Story, number 480, and In This Very Room. So if you'd stand and join us. Thank you. Oh 
For our call to worship this morning, I'll be reading Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that the power of the Holy Spirit may abound in hope. May I have the children, please, for a children's moment. Okay, so for the lesson today is uh, on parables. Do you know what a parable is? No? Okay. Well, a parable is a simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson as told by Jesus in the Gospels. One of my favorite parables is the parable of the mustard seed, which I will be reading from. Uh, Mark 430 through 42 um, this is during Jesus's ministry around the Sea of Galilee so imagine you know a rocky windswept hillside you know by the hill is where he would have delivered this <clears throat> and he said with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it it is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when sown on the ground, is the smallest of seeds on earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. So this is how Jesus taught the words to the crowds, and he then later explains the meanings to the disciples um, in the Gospels. And um, it's in these short, apparently simple, yet eloquent, profound parables, Jesus plants the seeds of discipleship and fellowship with God so the world uh, may know the path of righteousness. And that's what a parable is. And that's how Jesus talks to us. So, thank you. You can, you can go back now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, brings us to our scripture reading for today, um, which is for, what's that? Oh, sorry, yes. Stewardship. Thank you. Good morning. I'll be quick. Um, <laughs> so, you know, every Sunday we, we have a stewardship moment and we talk a lot about what constitutes stewardship. Um, time, treasure, and talents, anything we give. But the core of stewardship is really something else. It's love. Stewardship isn't an event, a campaign, a moment. Um, it's a spiritual practice. The challenge of Jesus is nothing less than to question the, every system in which we take comfort that is not love. A holy practice of stewardship helps us see our dependence on those systems and slowly release our grip on them. When we place love at the center rather than money, possessions, power, we're unburdened by our connection to these things and can give freely without fear. Um, if you are feeling unburdened this morning, uh, we have the collection plate in the hallway. If you're here, if you're online, um, of course, you can always go to our website, lansingdisciples.org, and give. Um, there's a big donate button right at the top. You can't miss it. Um, now, please pray with me. Heavenly Creator, thank you for the gifts you have filled our lives with. Help us to look beyond our ties to things and allow us to give freely and with love. Amen. So now we have the scripture. <laughs> yes, uh, the scripture for today is 1 John 4, 7 through 9. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. 
Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God shows his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Amen. Um, so the message today will... Oh, okay, it's going I got my microphone. Thank you, Rick. What's up? <laughs> All right, if you don't know me, my name is Kate. I'm usually behind the piano. Uh, I've been a member of this church going on five years. September will be five years. Um, this is my first time being up here, so it's going to be fun. Uh, <clears throat> so growing up, I always went to church every Sunday, Easter, Christmas, you went to church. Um, I knew the basics of the story of Jesus. I know he was the son of God. I know he was sent to save us. He did a bunch of miracles. He was crucified. He died and he came back. That I, I understood that much. Um, I don't think I bothered to pay attention to the rest because I didn't really know details. So, I mean, I went to church every week, and I didn't even bother to retain any of that. So I didn't know who crucified him, why, why he made people so mad. I just didn't know, and I'm just like, it just never hit me until I was in a production of Jesus Christ Superstar. And yes, I could not stand up here without mentioning the musical. So yes, I had to throw in a musical there. Um, I also bring up this musical because I know a lot of our congregation are into musicals too. You either you either love attending them and watching them or and or you perform in them. Um, so regardless of if you're in the audience or if you're performing, um, you understand the concept of getting swept away into a musical. You lose yourself in the story, you lose yourself in the music and in the characters, you laugh with them and you cry with them and it's like the arts was meant to be empathetic or something like that. What a concept. So, as an, and as an actor, too, I get lost in the characters, and I get lost in the stage, and, and whatever show I'm in, I just throw everything on stage. Um, Jesus Christ Superstar was a heavy show. It was a heavy topic. It was a roller coaster of emotions, and it was a little exhausting, but satisfying and exhausting. Um, but during the production, I finally learn the story of Jesus. I'm like, oh, there's Judas, there's Pilate. Okay, I get, I get why everyone was mad. I get what Pilate had to do. It's all making sense now. So I finally started to understand Jesus as a story. But on top of that, um, this was the first time I felt like I felt I understood Jesus as a person. Because when, when I just thought of Jesus, you know, he's some guy in the sky that did all this stuff for us. When I saw him as a character portrayed by a human actor, I understood him more as a human. And that was the part that I think took me the longest to grasp was that Jesus was human. He was sent as a human. Um, so when I was getting ready for this message, um, the thing that kept coming back to me was the Christian catchphrase, uh, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Like, you put it on a keychain, you put it on a bracelet, it's the, it's the quirky thing for everyone to, if you have to make a decision, you say WWJD, and it's supposed to help you make the decision. Uh, so if we're faced with difficult decisions in life, what would Jesus do? Well, what does that mean? <laughs> what would Jesus do? Oh, in John chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords, and he drove them all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers, and he overturned tables. So what would Jesus do? Well, flipping tables and chasing people with a whip is not out of the realm of possibilities. Let's we'll start with that. Uh, in Mark chapter 8, uh, Jesus calms the storm. His disciples had to wake him up to calm the storm because he was sleeping. So what would Jesus do? He would take a nap. I, I'm down with that. Um, John chapter 11, when Lazarus died, Jesus went and he said, hey, I'm going to go wake up Lazarus. He had an intent when he went to the tomb to resurrect Lazarus. But when he got there, he cried. So what would Jesus do? He would cry. Um, Matthew chapter 26, Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground, and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, my, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So Jesus knew he was going to die. For 33 years, he knew he was going to die. He knew there was a plan he had to follow, and the night before, he had his doubts. And he was asking God, I know this is your plan, but can we not do this? That would be great. 
So he was scared. And this all comes back to me because he was human. Jesus was human. He flipped tables because he was angry. Uh, the disciples woke him up from his nap. He had been preaching all day. He was tired. He wanted to take a nap. Um, he cried for Lazarus. He knew. He knew Lazarus was coming back. And he cried for him anyway because he was sad. Because he was sad for his friend. Because he was sad for the people mourning for him. And all he could do was cry. So God made Jesus human by choice. He could have sent an angel. He could have spent a, sent a spirit. He could have sent himself to give any kind of message he wanted, but he didn't. He sent his son as a human. And I think it was because to better help us understand compassion and empathy. Um, though not necessarily, obviously for others too, but uh, more importantly um, for ourselves. I feel like we're more likely to give empathy and compassion to others more than we're going to give it to ourselves. Um, so what does this mean? Well, the answer to what would Jesus do does not have to be a grand gesture. It doesn't have to be a sacrifice. It doesn't have to be some great miracle. It could just be compassion for others and compassion for yourself. So when you're driving to work in the morning and you know it's going to be a long, stressful day and you take five minutes in the car to cry before you walk into work, maybe you're doing what Jesus would have done. Uh, when you have a billion things to do on your list and you are entirely overwhelmed and stressed out and you don't even know where to start and you decide to take a nap first, maybe you're doing what Jesus would have done. When you are devastated by the news or when you're angry at the injustice in the world or when you're scared to send your child to school, maybe you're doing what Jesus would have done. When you doubt yourself the most, like he did, maybe you're doing what Jesus would have done. Because again, he was human. We all feel these feelings. We feel anger. We feel scared. We feel tired. I love to nap. I can't count how many times I would nap if I could. And then so, and you get guilty over naps too, right? So the, the idea that we can get hard on ourselves for negative emotions or hard on ourselves for feeling emotions when that's what Jesus would have done. So Jesus was human like the rest of us. He meant to show us compassion and forgiveness. And again, it's easy for us to show compassion to others, and it's harder to give us to ourselves. Um, so if you take anything from today, I want you to practice empathy for yourself. You, I know plenty of you probably give it freely to others. We do not always give it to ourselves. So give yourself forgiveness and give yourself grace, because that's what Jesus would do. Will you pray with me, please? Dear Lord, thank you for making us compassionate beings. Help us remember that you chose to send Jesus as a human to teach us empathy and forgiveness. And may we always remember to extend the same courtesy to ourselves. In your name we pray. Amen. And now you got to wait for me because i got to move. Oh, but I can do it while I'm talking. That's cool. Okay. So uh, our invitational hymn will be number 517, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Please stand as you are able and join us.
now we come to a time of prayer. Um, we'll start off with, um, I believe it's Karen. Um, congratulations to, I believe, Erica um, on the birth of her new baby girl, um, born on Wednesday. So praises for that. Um, I have a prayer request for Shauna. Uh, Aiden remains on hospice and is getting weaker. So continue prayers there. Another from Shauna. Prayers for Patricia E. Dalton. Um, David Darvis, neurosurgery to remove tumor in this week. Uh, prayers for the family. Danielle Murphy rolled her ankle uh, during a race this morning. Uh, quick healing for her. Uh, Fred Wurzel has been admitted to Sparrow Hospital. Um, please pray for Fred and the Wurzel family. Um, I'd also like to pray for Fred Wurzel uh, that he makes out of the hospital today. Let us pray. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, our communion hymn is In Memory of Savior's Love, number 405. You may remain seated. On the night Jesus was prayed, as they were eating, he took bread <coughs> and said, Take, this is my body. And he, and he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say, you will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Please pray with me. God of mercy, you are one bread, and we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Lord, we thank you for allowing communion to unite us with your people. 
you are the bread of life, and we have come to partake of you so that we may have eternal life, and so that life can be brought to your body, both together and individually. Amen. Quick reminder, we have a board meeting at noon today. And I'd like to thank everyone for coming and worshiping the Lord with us all together today. Our closing hymn is What a Friend We Have in Jesus, number 585. Please stand if you are able. <laughs> 